So good morning uh, or good afternoon, uh, wherever you are. Uh, uh, you are. Uh, uh, you're very welcome uh, uh, to this uh, uh, special uh, uh, cultural economics online seminar. Uh, CEOs. I'm Elisabetta Lazzaro, uh, cultural economist uh, uh, and professor at the Business School for the Creative Industries, University for the Creative Arts uh, in the UK. I am also part of the uh, Association for Cultural Economics uh, uh, International Board, and uh, together with Andrea uh, Andrei uh, Srakar of the University of Ljubljana, uh, we uh, coordinate uh, the Cultural Economics uh, uh, Seminar online. And uh, uh, this is a special series because uh, uh, we uh, got the chance. Uh, uh, to have uh, once again uh, the, uh, the nominee and the winner of the um, prize for uh, uh, the young researchers uh, of the uh, biannual uh, international conference of the association that was held last year online, unfortunately, due to the uh, COVID restriction. So if you are interested in the Young Researcher um, Workshop, uh, this is held every two years together with the uh, International Conference of the Association. And uh, it is uh, our great pleasure uh, to, to have uh, uh, the three nominees and the winner of the Young Researcher in Cultural Economics Prize, uh, Mike Bowman, Matthias Sali. Uh, Satya Rochnek and uh, Martina Dattilo. Uh, actually, uh, Satya, Satya was uh, the winner, he's the winner. Uh, we are still awaiting for Martina to join us. Elisabetta, so I will just shortly interrupt you. Matthias Sali was the winner, but he will tell us himself. I apologize. Uh, my, my, my apologies. Uh, so we have a slight uh, change in the program uh, in the sense that we are still waiting for Martina uh, to join. So uh, we will have, uh, uh, we will start with Mike Bowman and uh, each presentation will last uh, 15 minutes uh, and uh, we will have uh, an overall uh, Q&A discussion session at the end. Uh, so, um, Andrea, perhaps you would like to introduce uh, the first presenter? Okay, so hello also in my name. I'm really grateful to all four of the presenters, to all who are here. Uh, this promises to be a great uh, seminar. So for the first presentation, uh, we welcome Mike Bauman of Birkbeck University of London, who will present digital art history. What can auction sales data tell us about collectors' preferences with contemporary art? Without further ado, uh, most of you, I think, were also on the conference itself. I invite Mike to the floor and to the presentation. Please, Mike. Well, thanks very much for the introduction. Just, uh, just, just briefly to mention myself, I'm Mike Bowman. I've just completed my PhD in the history of art at Birkbeck University of London. My PhD is in digital art history, so it's not to do with looking at digital art, but is about the use of statistical methods and digital resources in art history. Um, my thesis consists of three case studies, each looking at different kinds of techniques and different kinds of data. And in my short presentation today, I'll take you through the work I've done on one of those case studies, which is out of looking at what auction sales data can tell us about collectors' preferences with contemporary art. The thought process that got me into this case study can be illustrated by looking at these two paintings by the American artist Cy Twombly. On the left, we have his Death of Pompey, executed in oil and graphite on canvas in 1962. And on the right, we have an untitled work executed at the same time using the same media and of a similar size. If you ignore the background colors as well, which are just an artifact of the only images I was able to locate online, the two pictures are visually very similar. One thing that struck me though, when I was reading through the literature on Twombly was that most of the authors that I read had focused predominantly on Twombly's works with specific titles such as Death of Pompey, rather than those which Twombly didn't title such as Untitled on the right. 
But if we look at his official catalogue, we find that Twombly didn't give titles to 65% of his paintings, a practice that persisted through his artistic career. And the same is true actually for most of the other artists I'll be looking at today. And noting this, noting this bias within the critical literature prompted me to want to explore this issue of whether the type of title can make a difference to how a work is received, but in a context well suited to the application of quantitative techniques using statistical methods. I wanted to see what auction sales data can tell us about preferences collectors may have had between works by the same artist presented at auction with specific titles or as untitled or with generic titles such as abstract or number one. And the method I turned to was that which well established in culture and economics. Linear regression is used by, has been used for several decades by cultural economists to look at the price determinants of sales of artworks at auction. In my case, in my models, I've developed looking at the auction sales price in real US dollars to allow me to make comparisons across time and between countries. And the explanatory factors include those which standardly feature in the literature. I've included the size of the work, the medium, whether it's in oil or not, the date of the sale, which allows you to see how prices have been changing over time, the auction house where I've compared Sotheby's and Christie's with other auction houses, and the locations where there were significant volumes of sales. I've also included in my model the art of the, sorry, the age of the artist at execution and a, and a specification of the type of title the work had. Uh, having one category for specific titles and a second category for untitled works or generic or works with generic titles. Where I differ from most of the models in the literature is that I've modeled each artist separately rather than the market as a whole. And I did this as I wanted not to just look at averages across the market, but to be able to compare and contrast collectors' preferences by the same and different artists. And as you can see, it also broadened my study out from not just looking at the type of title, but looking into other characteristics of artworks. The primary source of use of my data was artprice.com, the art market information provider, which consolidates auction sales data from over a thousand auction houses worldwide. And I used a number of criteria to search the art price website to identify the artists I was going to model. They had to be contemporary artists, by which I mean somebody whose works have been sold at the, by the main auction houses at sales advertisers being of contemporary art. As I was modeling each artist separately and wanted to look at questions of, such as the impact of the location, I restricted my search to artists with an international presence in the auction market. I also restricted sales to either paintings or sculptures and only considered artists whose sales consist of a mix of works with different kinds of title. Altogether, these criteria restricted the number of artists I could look at to 11 so I to 12, 11 painters and one sculptor. And the art price data covers auctions from 1984 to 2019, which is the year when I collected the data. And altogether, there are over 5,500 auction sales across the 12 models I've developed. Before I come on to take you through the modeling results, just uh, listed the 12 artists on this slide. You've probably heard of some, if not most of them. All of them are among the best-selling contemporary artists at auction. Most feature regularly in the top selling 50 contemporary artists worldwide, and several are in the top 10 with average sales prices in the millions of dollars. So now to take you briefly through the results. Uh, as with many other studies, the models I've developed is one where size is an important determinant of the auction price. It was a significant factor for all of the artists I've looked at. And in my models, for most artists, doubling the size of their paintings increased the average price achieved at auction by over 70%. Collectors may consider that the size of a work is a sign of its quality, or may simply be prepared to pay more for a larger painting as it covers more wall space. Several other studies have also developed models in which there's a maximum size for paintings beyond which they decline in price. The usual explanation given is that private collectors may not have the wall space to accommodate the largest work sold at auction. I've looked at a different context to those studies, and in my models, that was not the case with almost all of the artists I've looked at. The collectors of those artists were not deterred by the largest works. We might look to understand that in terms of uh, changing the demand for contemporary art. Collectors at the top end of the auction market have increasingly been putting their purchases into storage, especially when buying for investment purposes. 
and the number of public and private contemporary art museums has grown hugely in recent decades, both of which would have boosted demand for larger paintings compared to the earlier contexts I've looked at in other studies. With those artists whose sales included a mix of different media, collectors generally paid a premium for paintings and oil. The traditional hierarchy in the fine arts was that paintings and oil were where an artist executed their most important works. And it could be that these views have continued to influence collectors of some of the artists I've looked at. My models also give some insight into structure and change at the top end of the auction market for contemporary art. For most of, the, of that period that I've looked at, the most important events were the contemporary art weeks held in New York and London twice a year, where both Sotheby's and Christie's will hold day and evening sales. These are heavily promoted with buyers around the world. And in recent years, Philips has looked to compete directly with Sotheby's and Christie's. And other smaller auction houses will have sales of art during those weeks to tap into this demand. We can see from my models how these efforts have paid off by the auction houses that probably around half of the artists I've looked at sales of Sotheby's and Christie's resulted in a better sales price, and for none did it result in a worse sales price, as did selling in the USA or the UK. Uh, the auction market has its ups and downs, and particular artists can come into and out of fashion. In my modelling, I've made adjustments for those factors so I can get an estimate for each artist of the underlying rate of appreciation of their sales price at auction. And for nine of them, those were quite substantial, 8% per annum or more in real terms. And accumulated over the 35 or so years of sales I've modeled, these increases can be very, very substantial. With Gerhard Richter, for instance, real prices for his paintings increased nearly 30 fold over the period that, I, that I've looked at. I've used the form of model, which allows me to look at how prices can vary for works executed at different stages of an artist's career. These results are suggestive and show three distinct patterns, which I presented an example of each on this slide, which shows how relative prices have changed with the age of the artist of execution. With the two who died before the period of sales and models, collectors were indifferent between works executed at different stages, as you can see with the graph for Alexander Calder. With most of the six artists who died during that period, collectors preferred early career paintings compared with mid-career works there's also a pickup in price with paintings executed late in their career, as you can see with Sigma Polka in the middle graph. Several studies have shown that there's a death effect in the auction market with prices for an artist's work increasing after they die. And so paintings executed late in an artist's career may first come onto the auction market once collectors have the expectation they may soon increase in price. These expectations would boost the average price of later works compared with earlier ones and might account for the late career pickup you can see in my models. All of the four artists who were living at the end of the period of sales I modeled have aged profiles similar to the one I've shown here for Albert Olin. For all four in my models, early works sold for less than mid-career paintings, and there is a peak age for each artist beyond which price is going to decline. So you can see these patterns are quite suggestive, but to develop a full explanation would require a detailed study of how the histories of those artists have been constructed by art historians, critics, curators, and the main auction houses. The interrelationship between the age of the artist and the historical period during which they work would also need to be considered. And you'll obviously also need to look at more artists to confirm the strength of the patterns you can see in the small number that I've looked at. I think this is certainly an area that would merit further research. Finally, let's just look at the question which led me into the work I presented here today. For nine of the 12 artists I model, collectors paid a premium for works with specific titles. For most artists, that premium was in the range 10 to 20%. And for Yoshimoto Nara, it was 60%. Again, we can look to venture some explanations as to why collectors may have had those preferences. I've already mentioned the disproportionate attention given to paintings with specific titles by critics. This may have influenced collectors, but it's unlikely to, to uh, explain the significant premium given to speculative, given to specific titles. We could also speculate other reasons why through thinking about what a title does and how that might differ between a specific and a generic title. A specific title more definitively identifies the work, singling it out from other works by the same artists and contributing more to the meanings that it's given. In doing this, the specific title may be more seductive in the sense of being more attractive in attracting potential buyers to the work compared to one with a generic title where that isn't the case. And indeed, some support for this view comes from empirical work 
which has looked at individuals' reactions to paintings. Several studies have shown that having a meaningful title can increase the viewer's liking of the work. For Gerhard Richter, collections were indifferent between paintings presented with a generic title abstract build or as untitled and those presented with specific titles. Where Richter differs from all the other mod artists I've modeled is that his its abstract build, which is the most by far the most common generic title which he used, almost all of his paintings that don't have specific titles are given that title. And indeed, in the critical literature, the plural of abstract build is often used as a name for all of his abstract paintings, however they are titled. And so I'd speculate that abstract build has taken on a brand value, which simply presenting a painting as untitled wouldn't allow. Collectors have been indifferent between a branded Richter abstract and one with a specific title. However, I'm unable to venture any explanation of the collector's preferences with Cy Twombly, where paintings presented as untitled commanded a premium, or with Joan Mitchell, where collectors were indifferent. And in the Q&A session today, I welcome any, any possible explanations you may think of as to why that, why that was the case with those artists. So to finish, just briefly summarize what I've done. It's of art historical value to have an understanding of what motivates collectors of art and their preferences between paintings. And regression modeling, such as that used in cultural economics, allows for measurable or classifiable characteristics of artworks that might influence collectors to be investigated. Conventional art historical methods don't allow the art historian to, to do this and develop the kind of disaggregated understanding of collectors' preferences I've presented to you today. My work on preferences for works with different kinds of title with different artists is new in cultural economics. In other areas, as I've shown you, my results recontextualize earlier studies showing how market structures and collectors' preferences may have changed. And my work also brings out some strongly suggestive patterns which might merit further investigation. Right, thank you very much. That completes the presentation. Thank you a lot, Mike. Um, due to time reasons, I suggest we move to another presenter and we will have the debate on yeah. the presentation. So later. we will have. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Andre. Uh, so uh, we will have now the winner uh, of the Young uh, Researcher in Cultural Economics, uh, uh, Mattia Sali uh, from WIPO, uh, Department of Economics and Data Analytics, uh, as well as University of uh, Neuchâtel. And uh, he will present uh, his research on uh, intermediary liability and trade in follow on innovation. Matthias, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks so much for the invitation and the presentation. Um, can everyone see the screen and hear me? Yes, yes, everything is seen. Good, great. Yes. So I, I would. Um, I uh, would love to start this presentation with the following um, painting that I created and think that I, uh, that most of you are familiar with, um, with the underlying artwork here. So we did research on appropriation of artists. And I think um, what I did here is probably definitely not a good appropriation artwork, but um, it some sort um, um, gives the idea of what appropriation art could be that like namely I randomly choose two different like colors and I think the whole artwork can have a different meaning at least in the context of times that we are in. So um, the, the, the research we, we did on was on intermediate liability and training follow-on innovation which sounds a bit like complex but I hopefully will explain what we did in the field of law and economics um, in the following few uh, minutes. And this is work done by Alexander Kuntz uh, and me. Alexander Kuntz is from, from WIPO and I'm as well from WIPO and from Neuschwerke. I would love to start this presentation with some art history background as Mike did before, which I think is important to understand our, like our research question then and results we found as well. So um, appropriation art is the, our practice um, with the use of pre-existing objects um, with um, applying little or like almost no transformation to um, them and reusing other objects. On the left hand side, you can see here uh, a photography by Walker Evans from 1960, from, from um, 1936, sorry, 
Um, and in the middle, you can see an artwork by Sherry LeWine. Um, and Sherry LeWine is one of the most famous appropriation artists. And I think it's, 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 like, it's nice to understand appropriation artwork if you have a look at these examples. So uh, Sherry LeWine once stated that she uh, dismisses every creative act in her artwork here. And although it's visually identical, um, she claims that those artworks, like a photography or artwork here, the print, have different meanings. Um, Lewine, for example, re-feminizes the whole series of um, photographies by Walker Evans by, um, by making point about feminism, for example, and how their voices were undervalued in um, back then, at least. Um, so, and on the right hand side, you can see an example of um, of a painting that you might have not like thought that you, you know the artist, and you're right and you're wrong. So, um, on the right hand side. The, the, the painting that you can see is um, from Elin Stute one, and it's called Warhol Flowers. And in that case, even Warhol, um, Andy Warhol gave um, Stute one the silk screens, and um, uh, Elin Stute one was interested in what, it, what, what happens if she reproduces the same words as from the famous um, uh, artist uh, Andy Warhol, and what will happen afterwards. So our research and what we did um, um, is actually a bit on like, it, it uses um, appropriation artists, but we, we leveraged this whole idea on a bit of, uh, on a higher level, namely on law and economics in general. So um, first of all, research has been done on like, is copyright sup uh, law superfluous in, in, in arts, in visual arts? Because does it provide any inset, economic incentive to create, um, art since like um, the threat of being copied is, is definitely lower compared to a musician, for example. Research, research has been done in the cumulative creativity. So for example, the question of broad copyrights might impede reuse. Um, um, yes, but our paper is a bit more different that that's actually what was new. Um, at least um, we, we thought it's, it's quite novel in, in the law and economics field is that we did research on the, um, the topic so-called contributory liability. So the question is, obviously all these artworks that I've showed you before um, created some sort of um, copyright infringement lawsuits at least. And questions being put to copyright law, how much can an artwork rely on, um, on downstream upstream um, up, uh, artworks? And our question is, can this liability extend to intermediaries in markets, such as auction houses, galleries, or museums? So why um, is this question important is that might copyright law um, changes or practice um, copyright law practice changes um, do not um, change incentives to create artworks, but maybe it puts some sort of contributory, contributory liability to auction houses and um, these artworks are um, so less, for example. So might copyright policies create secondary market effects as we call that and it creates some sort of legal uncertainty that trickles down to the intermediaries. And our empirical strategy to research on that topic was actually that we, uh, we created a treatment group and a control group. The treatment group is obviously, obviously the appropriation artist. We, Create a control group that I will um, explain in a second, and we apply the so-called difference and difference strategy. Difference and difference strategy makes use of a change in law practice or even a change in the whole um, policy and tries to analyze if uh, market participants react to that when you control to, um, to a control group that is not treated in the same period. So for, um, for a difference in difference strategy, the exogenity of the shock, um, so of the change in law practice, for in our case, uh, was important. So it's um, it, it's nice, or you have a good um, empirical strategy and a setting if the exogenity of the shock of the change in law practice is given. Um, we did research in the literature, ask um, law schoolers, analyze Google Trends, and had a look at the art market to find out when actually appropriation artists might would have been affected the most um, and when it could be that possibly we'll see um, in different time frames, of course, but when we could see maybe uh, market reactions on the secondary market. 
And the second requirement is, of course, that you have a good treatment group or control group. And as I mentioned before, so one important uh, point is that you have a, a shock that is some sort of exogenous given. And we came back to the case Corio versus Prince in 2013, that based on our research, we thought that is the most important and as the New York Times once uh, stated, the most closely watched copyright case to rattle the world of fine arts as they claim. So the photographer Corio published in 2000, the photography series called Yes Rasta. And Richard Prince, a very known appropriation artist in 2008, uh, created collars uh, reusing Cariou's work. And it, important for, like, for our research now is that Cariou, the photographer, sued both Prince, Richard Prince, the appropriation artist, and the Gagosian Gallery for copyright infringement. And questions being put to copyright law and eventually to courts, uh, whether um, Richard Prince artworks were fair use or not. So recall again and fair use is a doctrine known in the US law and as well in other um, in other jurisdictions that permits limited use of copyrighted material without having first to acquire permission um, uh, from the copyright holder. Fair use is one of the, um, the most known limitations to copyright law and intended to balance interests of copyright holders with the public interest. And in interest of time, I will just like briefly explain what happened um, in this court case and why we think that um, this shock is um, exogenous and that it was not anticipated by market participants and why we think that um, the whole secondary markets um, could have uh, reacted to this decision. So um, in 2011, the lower court decided that um, all artworks from, from Richard Prince were copyright infringing. Um, however, in 2013, um, the higher court, the second circuit, changed that from all copyright infringing to um, 25, 25 out of 30 are transformative enough, so fair use. And one could now argue that this decision was in favor of appropriation artists, but as we argue, the opposite is true. So this decision was really badly received. So first of all, um, still five are um, not fair use. So um people people were left with the question like 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 when does fair use now apply in visual arts um specifically in appropriation for appropriation artists and uh when not then second of all um the the second circuit so the higher um decision in 2013 seemed to accept that the gagosian gallery was um contributory liable uh, liable for copyright infringement and so eventually i think that um all of the market participants were unhappy with this decision. We um, did research as, um, as stated before, for example, based on Google search volumes, and we tried to analyze when people were Googling um, for the Curry versus Prince um, uh, decision. And we see indeed that it spiked in 2013, that people were mostly interested around 2013. Of course, you have some sort of anticipation, but we can control for that. In in econometric, uh, econometric spe specifications. Um, we compare this court case as well with Roger versus Coons in, from back in 1990, um, I guess, around there. And we see that Google search volumes never spiked above um, this threshold, this relative threshold that Google search volumes produce. And, okay, so, we have some sort of an empirical strategy. We have an exogenous sh shock, a change in law practice, as we argue. And we have an idea of what our treatment group could be and control group. So we need appropriation artists and we need control, um, like closely enough um, artists, but with no appropriation um, uh, background. Um, how did we do that? So we used as well as Mike Art Price. Um, dot com to um, collect uh, auction results of those artists and we used artsy a service provider that um, is mainly important was mainly important for us since they um, distinguish artists with so-called genetic information as they call that so they do not only um, distinguish between appropriation artists or not but like in like in many genetic information that's for example that 
um, someone was known to work in Paris or that um, so this artist was like um, friend with those art group like you have different group of artists and stuff like that so you have hundreds and even thousands of genetic information that you can combine and basically what we did in order to um, address our empirical setting we um, took a bunch of very close artists with the appropriation genetic information and some of them had it not so we used all artists with the same information but the only difference is the appropriation uh, uh, genetic information that they have and then we uh, we we said that one of them is our treatment group and one is the control group we eventually um, ended up with lots of auction results in um, decades of years in many countries and many auction houses and maybe in interest of time, I um, I uh, I skip the, the boring econometric parts and like show you results with a bit more like easier to interpret um, uh, visual visual results. So we had a look at what you can see on the top left is the total numbers of auctions the appropriation artist had compared to our control group around the time frame of 2013. We as well looked at the hammer price formation and whether um, the auction did result in a sales success or not, since many artworks were not sold. So I, um, I think around 20 or 30 percentage in total, like over the whole period of artworks were not sold. So it's interesting to see whether you have some sort of a demand reaction. Um, it's questionable, however, if, if you like, if, if since we look at intermediaries, if we see demand reactions or this effect is driven by um, by supply effects so that maybe auction houses do not even like put um, appropriation art books at say. And eventually we also had a look at uh, the percentage of US auctions that appropriation artists had since we uh, looked at the change in copyright law practice in the US and obviously um, this could maybe only be um, uh, could only affect uh, the US market and European markets, for example, remain unchanged. And so to summarize, maybe um, our results that we found is that, so global auction trade in appropriation arts decrease and partially relocates to non euros jurisdictions. That we what we found um, in terms of appropriation artists, auction results when you compare it to very close group of artists in the same time period. But the sales probability of potentially infringing appropriate artworks decreases as well. However, we couldn't find any significant change in the pricing of these artworks. So if I can go back, this is a bit similar to, um, um, to what Mike um, presented before. We also produced hedonic price models where we try to have a look and to better understand what is actually driving the price formation of the artworks. And we use this information of the price formation to also better estimate, for example, the total number of artworks that were sold or the, um, the, the demand side reactions that we had a look at. And eventually we claim that there is obviously a role of copyrights in the visual arts and particularly in the cases of follow on innovation as what we call appropriation art. And also, um, uh, that it trickles some sort of down to secondary markets and um, that I think in the law and economics field, contributory liability is something that will be um, discussed um, more and more, I think, since this could be also an interesting angle of research. So thanks a lot for Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, for this uh, presentation. So once again, uh, uh, the visual arts uh, and uh, the market for the fine arts. Uh, and so now let's switch to the third presentation. Great, so we have Satya Rojinek. Um, so uh, Satya comes from Faculty of Economic Sciences, University of Warsaw and the Digital Economy Lab of University of Warsaw, and she will present an article, I think, jointly with Wojciech Hardy, who is also here, incentivizing pirates to pay an experiment with comic book readers. 
Satya, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Let me just share my screen. Mm, can you see it well? Yes, maybe get to okay, the full screen. Yet. Now maybe yes. to, the, to the full screen, maybe. Okay, I, I did it to the full screen. Like, yeah, like. Oh. Uh, just a second. Yeah. Here we go again. <laughs> Let's try or maybe just. Maybe? Yes. Now? Yes. No, okay, excellent. perfect. Great. So thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, yes, I would like to present my, my joint work with Wojciech uh, Harty, in which we tried to incentivize potential pirates on the comic book market to change behavior and pay for digital copies of comic books. So internet piracy remains a concern across the creative sectors, even while we are actually witnessing a a growing availability of um, various authorized providers and researchers and policymakers focus mostly on restrictions and punishments. But while the pirates are also buyers, we should think um, not only about how to reduce piracy, but also how to convert it into, into paid consumption. So. Now I'm going to provide you with a, a brief introduction to the ways we, we chose to incentivize individual to pay. Um, and also I'll throw some, some light on why we looked at the comic book market. So building on economic theory, we propose two directions for incentivizing paid consumption. First, for those who have uh, for those who have no experience with legal channels, switching costs could present barriers barriers toward paid consumption. And just to clarify, those switching costs are um, are defined as one-time costs that uh, facing the buyer who switches from one um, one supplier's product to another's. And they play important role in shaping competition between digital providers. And this may take form of setup costs, such, such as, for example, um, registration or installing apps or some learning costs, um, for example, getting acquainted with interface or managing a digital library. And then the second uh, way of intense, uh, incentivizing paid Mm, consumption relates to recurring consumption from a source which uh, could support building loyalty to to a legal provider and then contribute to habit formation and we explored those uh, two approaches within the context of comic book market and we we figured out that the comic book market presents a unique opportunity to understand whether those uh, switching costs can be overcome as, as for example, the um, traditional formats, printed, uh, printed formats have grown in the presence of, its, of digital alternatives. So there, there certainly are some factors that stop readers from switching to those digital formats and also the Mm, the unpaid sources are extremely easy to access as you can just type it into Google and then read it in your browser. And the American uh, comics constitute ongoing series so that we can look at them as uh, single goods consumed, uh, consumed over time so that we can study the subsequent uh, behavior. And furthermore, Mm, digital and print formats have the same initial prices and the same uh, release dates so that we eliminate the price, price um, difference from, from an, uh, our analysis and the digital uh, market is dominated by uh, one provider. It's called Comixology. It's, it's a Amazon uh, platform with a broad range of titles from most publishers. So how are we trying to incentivize the, those pirates to, to pay? We thought that overcoming some of the switching costs associated with, with, with consumption from an online store 
um, online store that sells digital formats of comic books could, uh, could change an individual's consumption behavior. So random subsamples of our survey responders received um, specially designed comic book prices. And the first kind of price was based on on their own choice of the on the own choice of responders. The winners were asked to choose a a set of comic books with a cumulative price up to ten euros, which were then bought for them, and we called it treatment one. And the second treatment was based on our own choice. Uh, we provided uh, a sample of responders with comic books that they uh, have not read before. We, we get, got the information from the answers uh, in the survey and um, in, in, the, in our analysis, the information about the prices was utilized to, to calculate their potential effect on consumption behavior. So just, just before I go to the details uh, and analysis of the treatment, I would like to briefly discuss the data we collected. Mm, we conducted the, an online uh, survey among comic book readers in three uh, waves, in monthly waves in 2019. And for uh, the first wave, we sent the invitation uh, to the survey through several public forums and community groups on comics. And uh, we informed about the topic and about the prices in the form of digital comics. And we got uh, 432 respondents, uh, responders who finished the survey and majority of them was um, from Reddit. And a month after the survey, we sent an invitation email uh, with an email with invitation to participate in a follow-up survey. Uh, with, with higher chances of rewards. And we did the same after the third month. And we ended up with 157 responders in all three waves and 228 in at least two rounds. So each of the uh, waves contained question about, questions about habits, reading habits and interest and basic demographic information. So we got heavy comic book readers who trade, tried various formats and channels of acquisition of comic books, and the majority reads physical comic books. So also we had two thirds that um, have in the past purchased a digital comic book. Uh, only half of them uh, have done so through the Comixology store. And we also got the information that uh, 71% of the responders have in the past either downloaded an unauthorized copy of comic books from the internet or have read it um, online. And the responders in our samples were typically male, uh, aged between 18 and 32, and from the USA. And uh, moreover, as, as a recurring part, uh, of the survey, the responders were asked to indicate which of the top 50 popular comic books from the prior months they have read. And in the first survey, the list included the top 50 best selling comic issues. In the second survey, we gave the priority the, to comic issues that constituted the um, follow up to issues from the first, uh, from the previous survey. And the same was uh, done for the third one so that we ended up with 30, 23 comic series in each wave and some new series that made it to top 50. And uh, for each of the Mart comics, we asked um, uh, the readers to indicate how they acquired them. And uh, we see that while many of the responders have used unpaid sources um, for the titles uh, in the sample, uh, the share is actually much lower than, than the total share of responders who have indicated having used an unauthorized source in the past. So it's like 21% for the, uh, for the um, titles in the sample versus 71 that have done used an unauthorized source in the past. And this shows that most of the readers in our samples were familiar with at least some unpaid sources, but do not, do not usually use them for their reading needs. And 
we see that once um, consumers start reading a series in a specific format, they are unlikely to switch between uh, the format midways. We had uh, those non-paying uh, non -paying readers uh, switching to any paid channel mid-series in approximately 6% of the cases and from print to digital in approximately mm, mm, three. Uh, and all kinds of readers were more likely to stop reading a series than to switch uh, channels of acquisition. So moving to the first treatment, the switching costs associated with consumption from the comixology store were removed by providing some strong incentives to make use of the survey. The winner have to, had to browse through the comixology catalog and check prices and then to redeem the comics, they had to register an account and to read the comics using a mobile device, they had to download a uh, comicsology reader app. And the steps ensured that the recipients paid several switching costs, including some of the setup and learning uh, costs. And um, the recipients needed to conduct the registration process and download and install the app and put some effort to set it up. So um, also receiving those free comics at digital service might increase uh, customer loyalty to the service uh, because maybe because of the growing catalog uh, of owned items at the virtual book chart of that service. So uh, that was the first um, treatment and we hypothesized several uh, effects of the treatment. Um, we thought that as a di direct result of treatment one would be that the winners incur several of the switching costs and therefore experience a higher utility from buying digital comics in subsequent period. And it could translate into increased number of digital copies bought or lower number of unpaid copies acquired um, and into higher number of switches from unpaid or print to digital formats. Moreover, when picking a new series, a reader could be more willing to use a paid digital channel and also an increased perceived utility from those digital comics should translate into higher willingness to pay for, for uh, digital formats. And we find scarce evidence of any of the mentioned effects of treatment one on subsequent consumption. The, the effects on digital and unpaid acquisition are respectively respectively positive and negative, but unfortunately statistically insignificant. And winning in the first round or twice had a negative uh, effect on total unpaid consumption with a 10% uh, significance level. So, um, but still the results for, for switching and formats of new series and valuations uh, were inconsistent and typically close, close to zero. And the second kind of price did not require um, the responders to get acquitted with the platform. Rather, it was meant to see if such, such giveaway um, of, of this kind could incentivize the reader to follow a, a specific comic series by reading the subsequent issues next, next month. Mm, and as readers are not willing to, to, to change a format mid-series, it seemed to be a valid assumption, but we found no statistically significant effect of gifting an unread comic book on, on subsequent probability of its consumption by the reader. However, mm, when we controlled for whether this gifted title was read, the coefficient for unpaid acquisition of, um, of the subsequent issue be becomes larger and statistically significant at 5% level. And um, this suggests that while some of the prize winners were successfully incentivized to pick up a comic book series, they were uh, unfortunately most inclined to do so using a pirate source. And uh, to conclude, well, despite the wide range of considered effects, we found limited evidence of a consistent change in behavior of the consumer sample. So we think that overcoming the switching cost was not enough to incentivize the responders to switch to pay to digital sources. And maybe, maybe those um, switching costs were relatively low and not, not enough to offset the, uh, the perceived inferiority of digital format. 
and uh, there was like lower willingness to pay for digital formats and they have the same price as um, as the print one so that might have been uh, not enough to 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 change to change the behavior also it may be related to consumer culture as for example um, uh, the readers in the USA use uh, use uh, digital formats much less than the readers in, in Japan, for example. And also it can be due to the uh, fact that print formats um, are boosted with the collector value and digital formats lacks these uh, characteristics. Also, our sample consisted of readers who have previously used the Comixology store, so that uh, could lower the strength of the first treatment and it's also um, possible that the reader started using the digital store for titles that did not constitute the recent top selling titles actually we had winners who uh, got to choose their own sets of title and ask for all their comics or comic book collections so they might have been more likely to purchase digital issue of the series that are out of print for a longer time or that or maybe those that were um, cheaper than the print ones, for example, due to some discounts. And for such cases, overcoming um, switching costs could have carried stronger effects. And that would be all from me. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Great. Many thanks. Um, many thanks, Satya. And we have the four presenter, Martina Tatil, who just joined. Elizabeth. Yeah. Yeah. So we are very glad that Martina could make it uh, in, in the end. Uh, she was uh, she was planned to be the first presenter. Yes, so. I'm really, really sorry for the inconvenience. No. I have just a problem with the reminder. I'm in the UK. Uh, so basically my reminder was at 10 at the UK time. So <laughs> I'm really, really sorry for that. No problem, Martina. We are happy that you could make it. Uh, so just uh, not to, 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 to say that we keep uh, the female presenters in the end because we, we had uh, well sorted uh, originally the planning. Uh, so we, we are very glad that uh, you are here. So we are very uh, happy to present uh, your uh, presentation. So Martina uh, Dattilo for, from Creme CNRS, uh, University of Rennes, uh, one in France, and she will present uh, on another hot topic in cultural economics and not only in cultural economics, which is, is beauty defined by victors, an analysis of colonial sites of the UNESCO World Heritage List. Martina, the floor is yours. Okay, so I uh, will share my screen. Yes. Okay, um, just, okay, can you see the screen? Yes, you can start. Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, so thank you everyone for attending this uh, presentation. So today I will present this uh, uh, joint work with my two supervisors, this is uh, Fabio Padovano and Yvonne Rocaba at the University of Ren One. And in this paper, uh, we studied uh, the <clears throat> analysis made by UNESCO experts of colonial and native sites. So um, we, uh, there is a large literature about Europe being overrepresented with respect to other continents uh, in the UNESCO World Heritage List. Martina, uh, just one question. Yes, is yes. it possible this is put on full screen? It will be better visible. Now we have the comments also on the right. Yes, because you, you can see this free screen. Yes. Mm, okay. Ah, yes. I know why. I have a double. Sorry for bothering, but. No, 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 no. I didn't know how to. So... Now, now it's great. I will. Thanks. Now it's okay? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thank you a lot. <laughs> I'm going on. Uh, so I was saying that. Um, Europe is said to be overrepresented with respect to the other continents since it has included in the list uh, almost up the half uh, of the sides. And uh, there are different hypotheses about 
the reason of these overrepresentations, and there is probably a combination of more than one aspect. Uh, so some authors focus on the, uh, the lobbying aspect inside uh, the committees or more on the political aspects, while others focus on the ability of European countries to imposing a steady standard um, to the world heritage. So in this paper, we focused on this second aspect. Uh, since it has been longly discussed, but never settled in an empirical way. So we examined the perceived quality of sites uh, in country where uh, this can be either indigenous or European-like, so uh, the colonial heritage. And uh, we do not find any difference in, uh, in the evaluation of, of the quality of these two sites. So we could assume that at least in the year analyzed, that there are the la the last 20 years, um, UNESCO experts are impartial and the colonial heritage is not preferred. <clears throat> so uh, to give you a little bit of background for the ones that are not experts of the uh, World Heritage List, um, we know that being in the list is highly desirable by many countries since it increased the consumer demand. Uh, and the revenues from tourists, but it also uh, attracts public attentions and potential donors. So as I said before, this selection process uh, is said to favor a certain idea of heritage that is originated in the West. Uh, however, uh, this kind, this literature do not consider that world heritage is something that has originated in the past uh, through centuries of European dominations of the world. So, um, our research questions that we want to analyze is uh, if UNESCO experts actually privilege this idea of heritage or uh, there is a kind of difference of viability of heritage around the world. So to do that, um, we consider a stage of the process of descriptions when lobbying power is minimal. So again, we focus the literature on um, on UNESCO, uh, say that uh, most of the uh, of the political lobbying is conducted uh, during the committee uh, discussions. So we focused on the expert evaluation. So something that happens uh, that happened before. Uh, we examine a subsample of world heritage sites containing both post-colonial and pre-colonial heritage. So we exclude. Europe from the sample, but also natural sites. And we also exclude countries that were not colonized. So I know that this will be uh, a sensible topic, uh, but in order to analyze the data, we needed an official uh, date of starting of the colonization. And some countries, for example, China miss this kind of data, even if we can argue um, that there still is a kind of influence. So we verify which of the two types, post-colonial or pre-colonial size, uh, has the higher possibility to be on list of, and or receive the highest evaluation. So we propose two measure of quality. So um, we consider the number of criteria uh, for the descriptions that the site satisfies and um, eval docu. I will explain to you in a minute, but it's also based on this criteria, but it also includes um, the evaluations of the comparative analysis, uh, the integrity and the authenticity of the sites. So our baseline model is incredibly simple as this analysis is quite close to uh, a quasi experiment. So basically we just try to capture the difference between these two groups in terms of quality. Um, so we could, this simple model is estimated uh, uh, using two different measures of quality and three different measures of colonization that I will explain in a minute. And uh, since both our uh, dependent variable are non-negative integer, uh, we uh, we use a negative binomial distributions, and we also include a here fixed effect. 
So talking about our dependent variable. So uh, I know that um, there is there, there is a, a certain discussion if the criteria for being included in UNESCO list represent uh, quality or not. So here we focus on the fact that the higher the criteria satisfies, the more the values involved in a certain side. So um, this criteria that could be maxim maximum six uh, considers the aesthetical, historical, and representative values between the others. And to be included as size will satisfy at least one criteria. But our hypothesis is the larger the number of criteria satisfies, the higher the quality of the size. So the advantage of this measure is that it's incredibly simple, uh, is widely available, uh, and it also meets the way in which uh, the sites are included in the UNESCO World Heritage List. Uh, the disadvantage is that we cannot distinguish between sites that are nearly accepted and sites that are nearly rejected. So basically we don't have, we can't exploit the variations between zero and one, or a site meets one criteria or it meets zero. So it's rejected. This is why uh, we want to uh, explore these issues more deeply. Uh, so we also use EvalDocu that include, as I said before, the comparative analysis, the, integ the integrity, and the authenticity. This in addition to the criteria. Uh, it is computed using a textual analysis approach on the ICMOS evaluation document. So the advantage is that it's more complete and precise than criteria. Uh, however, it is strictly based on the, uh, the way in which the evaluations are written. So uh, it's not possible for us to collect comparable data uh, before 2007. Talking about the independent variables, so the colonization one, uh, first we use an extremely simple measure uh, that is called POSCO. So it, uh, this is a dummy that is equal to one when the site was constructed after uh, the colonial invasion of the country and zero otherwise. So it's site specific. So it's allowed a within country variance, uh, but in some ways uh, it relies on research descriptions. Um, as you can see from the box plot, uh, the difference is mean is not statistically significant, neither on criteria or on uh, eval -docu. So why uh, I said that this variable could be partially subjective? Well, because for some sites, deciding if they are colonial or pre-colonial is straightforward, while for others is more tricky. This is particularly the case uh, where uh, the colonizations arrive quite late or even uh, when a certain kind of heritage already show a mix between colonial uh, and native cultures. Therefore, we decide to take other two types of control. So the first one that we call domination, uh, exploit the durations of the colonizations. So it's, it is computed as the number of years from the first invasions of European to the date of independence. And our assumption is that the longer the dominations, the higher the likelihood that any site within the country is colonial. So, uh, domination has the advantage of reducing the subjectivity of the analysis with respect to the simple dummy, uh, but on the other way, it's country specific. So we can't exploit uh, the within country variance. Uh, just doing a simple correlations analysis, analysis we found that uh, this correlation is not statistically significant. We consider a third control that we call distance that is calculated as the distance from the coast as the crow flies. Uh, it has specifically good statistical property since it is continuous and site specific. Site -specific. Uh, we made the hypothesis that 
the closer is a site to the coastline, the more likely it is that has been built by colonizer. So this is based on historical evidence that colonial invaders first arrived from the sea and then penetrated the inner territory. And in, it allows us to minimize the research interventions and also to exploit the within country variance. But again, uh, we do not find any correlations with our variables of quality. So just pointing out our results, we find no evidence in uh, differences of devaluations of colonial native size. Since colonial is never statistically significant, uh, our p-values is quite far from the level of significance of 10%. Uh, all the estimates point out then um, size has been evaluated in a different way for with respect to the reference here. And uh, even if our free measure of colonizations have different statistical properties, they are coherent between them. And this is sustained by other analysis we made. So uh, to conclude and to summarize a little bit, how our work investigate uh, the process of evaluations and descriptions of UNESCO World Heritage sites, thanks to two original proxy of quality of world heritage. And uh, it tries to uh, create uh, an interest around the issues of European overall presentations in, over, in the World Heritage List and critically revise these issues. Um, so we do not find at the moment um, evidence that European aesthetics prevail with respect to the native ones, at least in the last 20 years and in the way um, experts analyze these sites. So it suggests that if the lobbying part uh, is done after this stage. And uh, this seems quite robust, even after controlling for time trends, the type of size, size continent, and the expert origin. So a lot of robustness check that I don't have time to present at the moment. And by the way, thank you a lot for your attention and for the patience. Thank you very much, Martina, uh, for your presentation. Uh, we had a very interesting and uh, rather diverse uh, presentation this morning. Um, so I would like to, to break uh, uh, and uh, to start the, the discussion um, uh, um, by asking a joint question uh, to the first uh, two presenters. Uh, um, uh, that is... Uh, uh, to um, to Mike and uh, and Matthias. Uh, so because uh, your presentations uh, uh, are rather related, uh, because we are in uh, um, in uh, in the field of the contemporary art market. Um, uh, so Mike, do you think uh, um, uh, uh, title uh, plays uh, a major role uh, in branding uh, contemporary artist, uh, and uh, is that uh, uh, so? Is uh, to what extent uh, um, intermediaries may play a role uh, in this kind of uh, of branding through uh, through title, and this bridges uh, uh, to my other question uh, to Matthias, uh, because you presented a case study um, of uh, Caliu versus. Uh, uh, Prince, uh, but uh, uh, as we know, there was a, a very strong, uh, perhaps the, the strongest uh, uh, intermediary, namely Gagosian. Uh, so do you think that this fact was also exploited uh, um, in terms of uh, uh, trying to attract uh, more attention uh, uh, to the artist represented by the gallerist uh, uh, and therefore trying to exploit a legal case uh, uh, to, um, to further brand uh, an already established uh, contemporary artist. So if you would like to, to, to discuss together this uh, uh, double question. 
please. Shall I go first then? Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you for the question. Um, well, I think, as you saw with Gail Hydric, I looked at, I think it's, um, yeah, it, it's very strongly suggestive, the results from what I've done, that the abstract build has taken on a brand value. And as you say, there is uh, certainly a role of intermediaries that critics and curators and others who've written on Gerhard Richter's work do use the term as a almost as a brand to describe the whole of the series of abstract works which he's worked on from the mid 1980s through to the current day. So certainly the case with that one artist, obviously I can't really, it would only, it, well, I suppose it's really just speculative to consider whether those sort of effects have impacted other artists. But I mean, just off the top of my head, just thinking about some other for if you think about, say, Damien Hirst, he's actually very well known for having quite long and almost philosophical titles. You know, the impossibility of death in blah, 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 being one of his most famous titles. So I think, again, there, but obviously you need to study it in more detail, I think, that certainly suggests that those titles are playing some sort of branding role, helping to create Damien Hirst's identity as an artist. So I think it's, yeah, you're probably right, actually. I think it's certainly something, a, a subject which probably would merit further investigation. I think it's actually, yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Yeah, if, um, if. And Matthias, perhaps you would like to add something else? Yes, yes, I, I would like to add to, like, to your second question that is directly on my paper. So it's a bit of a general question. So there is like what well, some people say there is not not such thing as um bad advertisement so it goes a bit in that direction so i'm generally i would say and of course like um maybe gallery exploit those lawsuits to make their like their artists more famous and like, eventually increase uh profits but uh, i i think like for for, for, our, for our study it was important that the, the decision was not really that that participants were not able to anticipate the decision so that's a bit more what we exploited in the in the empirical setting and of course like eventually we look at um uh, a set of prominent artists but as well like we look at thousand artists and like many of them are um unknown so we we like although it starts with a case study as you said it's 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 more the change in law practice that was important, or there not not prints in itself that could bias the results. And I would like give back a bit of a question to Mike because I I find it very interesting, like this this whole like title um, questions. And of course, like I experienced um, similar problems that um, not all like that you observe differences in in qualities of reporting artwork titles by auction houses. So I'm not like sure anymore whether you only had um, Sotheby's and, 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 and other larger auction houses, but I realized that it's also a question of, of, um, of budget that maybe some, like some artworks would have titles, but the, the auction houses do not report it because they, um, they don't have enough money to, to properly um, name all the artworks do you experience or at least list listed in their data um, are you sure that like all your untitled artworks are actually really called untitled or do you expect some sort of bias there I think um, your comments are probably more relevant if you're looking more widely across the market if you're looking at more unknown artists um, certainly I think with the artists I looked at because they're they are very well-known artists I would expect that the and their, their prices, you know, they're selling for quite high prices. So there would be an investment from the auction house in ensuring the provenance of the work. And obviously the title is part of that provenance. And certainly um, I haven't actually done a sort of rigorous survey, but I've also have looked at the catalogue raisonnés for a number of the artists that I've included today. And there, yeah, the, the titles that are given in their catalogue raisonnés are faithfully represented by the auction houses when they're, when they're selling those items. Again, if you can relate the work of art to the catalogue raison a entry that again enhances the provenance of the work okay uh, is there any question also from the audience okay musoke we do not hear you we cannot hear you 
Um, and no. also, please uh, yes. remember to activate your camera when you speak. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Leo Musafir from Uganda. Are you hearing me? Yes, we're hearing you now. Okay. Uh, my question goes to Martina. Uh, Martina, you have talked about how the UNESCO criteria is being applied. Uh, I want to I want to ask you, don't you don't you see that the criteria used by UNESCO? to select site of world heritage sites is really not equal, it's impartial. Because I can see there are so many sites in low developing countries that have not been selected because maybe they lack a coverage, uh, they are in remote areas, but they have a really an important value to the tourism industry in the whole world, but because of the remoteness, uh, the level of development, we find most of those sites have been sidelined and have not been enlisted on the UNESCO uh, list because of so many factors that are surrounding the, the remoteness, the poverty, and the lack of development. For example, in many low developing countries, for example, Africa, there are many sites that are very beautiful, very nice, and they attract a lot of tourists from all over the world, but have not been given a chance to be enlisted on the UNESCO list. How do you see that uh, statement? Thank you. I'm Deo Musoto from Uganda. Yes, uh, thank you a lot for your questions. Uh, there are like a multiple aspects of this problem I recognize. And also last time that I present, uh, the, the girl discussing my papers were from, can you can you hear me? I'm hearing yes? you well. Eh? Okay. Uh, we're from South Africa and we raise a similar argument. And so first of all, uh, we acknowledge that the first step for the inclusions is up to the state. So the first step is that the state uh, should be willing, must be willing to submit a certain site and also to submit it in a proper way. So there are sort of uh, knowledge behind this process. Uh, by the way, uh, at, when we look at uh, the uh, heritage located in some countries, um, we can see that uh, in controlling like for this country variations and the, uh, sorry. Um, the point is that we can look at the two aspects of the problem using our variable. So we can look at the variation within each country and the variations between countries. And both in these two ways, we obtain the same results. But I know that your point is quite fierce and we are we are working on it but the point is that that in order to do that we should need a, a kind of list of all the heritage not even the tentative list but all the heritage located in a certain countries that this is a difficult thing to extract because almost everything could be heritage is motivated in a good way so this is quite difficult to do uh, but maybe in another paper we are trying to exploit this point as well. But uh, the limitations that I acknowledge is the fact that uh, our heritage is limited to what the country recognizes as heritage. And uh, for the moment, we cannot go behind this point. OK. Thank you. Great. Any further question from the audience? I will just shortly state few my questions and hoping the debate continues. Firstly, to Satya and Martina. For Satya, maybe a question about um, how did you, in terms of the modeling, how did you access the effects of the treatment in your, I would say, experiments in your models? Maybe 
just short information for Martina, you referred to the experts, naturally, the literature, Bertacchini and others, and so on. How do you, does your modeling refer to this um, with including all these expert mechanisms that they talk about possibly could change also anything in your results? Maybe for Mike as well, one question. Um, today, there is quite a literature, very recent literature, we talked about artists' names, not just titles of the paintings, but artists' names, say, Anne Sophie Radermaker and others could um, prices of the titles also be related to artist names and what could be maybe the connection here and for Matthias uh, basically there is naturally today quite uh, I think the difference in differences today is even the most uh, developing at least at the moment literature in econometrics um, I got reminded on the literature on multiple treatments in definitive. Could this maybe, you mentioned different lawsuits and different events. Uh, I think there was one from 2010 or 2013. Could maybe this inclusion of different uh, treatments in this analysis also provide any difference, one would say, in the difference in difference results? Thanks. Okay, so uh, for for the first treatment, we had um, actually kind of forced scenarios because we had the first scenario in which a person did not receive any price, right? And then the next scenario was that a person received the price after the first round, but not after the uh, the second round. Then we had the second scenario in person when where a person received a prize after the second, but not the first. And the first scenario, we had prize after each, each round. So we compared the uh, choices in round two uh, and three, and we had this control group that was uh, those who received no prize. And then we had the uh, basically OLS regression for the first uh, treatment on total paid digital and total uh, unpaid consumption and the number of switches from paid digital to unpaid mid series and the number of times that the new series was picked in a digital on unpaid or unpaid format and then we had that willingness to pay so that we can uh, compare each scenario to the uh, to the control group and for for the second treatment we had some we had a logistic regression on the acquisition after after receiving uh, a price uh, uh, the second treatment price so so that was basically what what we did thanks thank you so the second question i think was addressed to me Shall I just, uh, just give again just my my it's initial okay. yeah, Martina, but okay. yeah, yeah. Please, please please i'm sorry <laughs> no please uh, just, uh, yeah the, the issue about there is there are a number of um, cultural economists who looked at the questions of whether, of whether having been able to ascribe a name to a painting actually impacts upon the price paid at auction. I think the, the specific work you're referring to was around looking at um, Flemish old masters and being able to say the name, you know, the master of X, even if you can't give an actual name, you say this is a work by the master of X, and showing that that had a significant impact upon the auction price. So I really just I suppose just a few initial thoughts. I suppose what I want to try to do is to if you think about whether there are parallels between that work and the work that I've done, to think about the different functions and different ways in which being able to give a name to the artist is sort of similar or not to being able to give a specific name to a painting. I suppose in some ways there are similarities that it does single out the work. It does, you know, being able to ascribe it to an individual is something which identifies almost as brands, the work itself, so that may, may in itself have some value. I suppose where there are maybe potentially differences, I suppose certainly being able to give, you know, the, the master of X as being the creator of a work, it's something which I'm sure acts as a very strong quality signal within the auction marketplace. So that could probably explain quite a significant amount of the, the premium that's, you know, that have been able to ascribe a name gives in auction sales compared to maybe similar works which don't which aren't able to be ascribed to a master. But I don't think that probably doesn't apply to anyone in the same sense, at least for the, the artists that I've been looking at. It's very, you look at the, the paintings I showed you by Twombly, 
are very uh, sort of fairly typical of the ones that I've looked at across all artists. That there is a lot of visual similarity between the ones that are, that do and don't have titles. So whether having a title is more of a quality symbol that it's seen as being Twombly's better works compared to the untitled works, I'd say it's probably certainly less the less the case when you're looking at titles than when you're looking at names. Thank you. Thanks. Probably Martina, if you call me older. Yes. yes. Um, yes. Uh, Martina. Oh, sorry, but, is it, but is it on me? Can, it's Ma Martina, I think, but we can Martina, swap. Sorry. It's no worries. Martina, it's your first. Yeah, okay, thank you. So, uh, really, really in short, uh, the empirical analysis, uh, as I said, is quite simple. So, um, first of all, uh, we look at uh, the Wilkinson, we, sorry, the Wilcoxon test, so for the difference in mean with respect to uh, country that, um, with, with respect to heritage that is colonial and post-colonial. So we basically have uh, these two groups and we compare simply statistically uh, the means and then we perform a regression analysis when uh, the, um, the fact of being part of one group or another is simply a dummy variable. And then we complicated our regressions using the other two model that includes continuous variables. And then we add a lot of control variables to, um, to trying to know if some of these uh, um, variations could be captured by other factors. So we control also for uh, the continents, uh, and the characteristic of the sites and uh, a lot of other things. And to do that, we use uh, negative binomial distributions, both on uh, criteria and uh, eval docu variable. Okay. So this should be comparable in all, in all senses to this literature, right? Yes. Okay, great. I apologize, Matthias, yeah, it was a mix-up. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, as I announced, I must leave. Uh, I'm very sorry about that. Uh, I leave everybody in the hands of Andre. Uh, and uh, thank you for being here. Thank you to the presenters. And uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, in two weeks for our next uh, CEOs. Uh, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, Elisabetta. Yeah, if maybe we continue. Matthias, you had the play. Yes, thank you. Sorry. Um maybe like very briefly on that point. So excellent point. Um multiple treatment um time periods is um is a field that is like is growing different diffs. We um enriched in the newest version of the paper um various um other setting of different diff different diff estimators. With a with way more robust um, um, coefficients and with so where we allow to some sort of degrees of of um, uh, pre trends or difference in the pre trends and 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 all those like like Callaway and Santana newest um, estimators. What we don't do is like allow for multiple treatments because multiple treatments means multiple new issues that you all need to address. And my fear would be that we dilute um, some part of the results if we um, if we allow for many treatment periods. And the question is also like, are all of the artists at all the times always treated, or should we just use one point and then like properly test for uh, placebo timings and stuff like that? But it's excellent point. But um, yeah, maybe it could be just thinking also interesting as you know as you mentioned this diverse definitive literature that is currently growing up i think there is among other also a uh, literature on staggered adoption of treatment and so on maybe some of it is here because at least on first sight it seems i would say a little bit fuzzy in terms of the definitions like you mentioned of the treatment and control group and possibly this would make it even more robust to test it with some of this. Yes, yes. Of this. Thank you Great. very well. Great. I take this. Great. Thanks. Great. Any further questions?
If not, Elizabeth already said goodbye. I thank all of the presenters. Thank you for this very interesting symposium. Everything was recorded. It will be put up online today or tomorrow. Um, thank you to all, also to the participants for your questions. So as Elizabeth has said, we look forward to meeting you in uh, two weeks time. Everything will be announced and on the further culture economics online series seminars, as well as the work of the Association for Culture Economics International in general. So thank you again to all. It was fun time, I would say, hopefully also for the listeners who will listen to this on YouTube, I assume. Thanks again and hope to see you soon on a similar event. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the organization. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Presentations. <laughs>